Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Let's make dua inshallah and we'll start. Ameen, bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarakta adal jalali wal ikram. Allahumma rabbana yassar wa la tu'assar wa tamam bil khayr wa bika nasta'een ya fattah. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana innaka anta al-alimul hakeem. Allahumma rabbana zinna ilma nafi'a wa amala mutakabbala wa rizqan waas wa shifa'a min kulli daa. فسبحان ربك رب العزة أما يسفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين قال رب شرح لي ويسر لي أمري وحل لغة تم لساني يفقه قولي إن شاء الله تنتهي ونكمل على نوا لكتير إن شاء الله عن بلاد الرسول محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم and continuation of the notes on page 471 where we are talking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the construction of the mosque, Madinat al Munawwara, and what went into the construction of the mosque and the Ashab al Sufa, the people the, who were the madrasa, the school that was built next to the mosque. And we also spoke about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the size of the rooms that were built adjacent or close to the annex of the mosque, how close and how small it was. For the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, despite that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had gotten a piece of land as a gift, he chose not to accept this as a gift, but rather chose to live in that life where he could have what be in need and in want, so that he would recognize the companions who were in a similar state. Tonight, Inshallah, we're going to look on the same page 471 and turn to page 471 on the topic, the beginning of the Adhan. So we. Reach the stage where the mosque was built and all the prayer and the situation for the prayer. The Adhan, the call to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Adhan. The driving force of worship in Islam is unity and a sense of collective oneness. That is the most important thing that drives Islam together is that it's, it's salah or the worship is one of the most important things. There was not any particular symbol in the early stages by which congregational prayers may be observed. The worshippers guessed the times of prayer and visited the mosque and observed the prayer. The Prophet wasallam did not like that. He had intended to appoint some people who could summon worshippers from their homes, but that would have been difficult so he called his companions عنهم, for consultation. And this is a very important thing. The Rasul looked at his companions in finding a solution to the problem of what? Calling the people to pray. What this tells us is that in Islam, there is room to resolve issues and difficulties or confrontations or situations or even disputes or even things that we have difficulty in achieving together and that is done through consultation this is this is one of the things that the Rasulullah made chaos or analogy or made ijma and consensus of opinion upon amongst the things ijma or consensus of opinion the Adhan was one of those that he recommended and sought advice from his companions and what are some of the advice that was given different suggestions were put forward there were suggestions to raise a flag at the time of prayer on seeing which people may assemble for prayer but the prophet sallallahu did not like that he also rejected the christians and the jewish method of summoning worshippers by means of what? A bell. However, he liked the suggestion of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and instructed Bilal to call the azan. In this way, not only times of prayer are announced, but also there is a call to Islam five times a day. So, other methods were offered as suggestions in their discussion. One, raising a flag. And maybe by raising this flag, people would see it and know that this is the time to come to pray. But the Rasul never liked the idea of what? Having what? A flag raised for such a call. 
and neither was it by the ringing of a bell. The system of the used to call people at a time when congregational prayer or worship would start. But the Rasul sought suggestions and came up with the idea that Omar Radiallahu had had concerning a dream that he had in reference to the Azan. In this way, not only the times of prayer are announced, but also there is a call to Islam five times a day. In the six authentic books of a hadith, the six major books of a hadith, Bukhari, Muslims, Ibn Manas, so, you know, so, and the other books mentioned, these books of hadith they mention, it is narrated that Abdullah ibn Zaid radiallahu ta'ala is said to have suggested the words of the Azan. He was taught in a dream. One hadith also tells us that Omar radiallahu ta'ala learned these words in a dream. However, Imam Bukhari confirms the narration of Omar radiallahu ta'ala an, the proposal to blow the trumpet or ring a bell was put forward before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa but Omar radiallahu ta'ala suggested that the azan be called. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa then called Bilal radiallahu ta'ala and instructed him to call out the azan accordingly. So all the other aspects, trumpet, flag, bell, all of these things were rejected. But nonetheless, they were suggested. They were suggested as a means of calling people to pray. And out of that consultation, the azan came from Omar radiallahu ta'ala as a source of guidance for mankind. Now today, alhamdulillah, we watch the clock in our homes they are, give the azan at each call to pray. People have watches, phones that can tell us the call and the timings that the congregational prayer will be in the mosque, in the house of Allah. In the time of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they used to come in advance to the prayer, making effort for prayer. They look at the effort they make in finding a solution as to how they could congregate to worship and what the masjid used to be like. Filled with worshippers. Filled with worshippers. The Sahabas made effort to come to the house of Allah. What they tried to rectify was what? An exact time. How they can reach together at one time. And in reaching at that time, the Adhan was suggested. One of the benefits of the Adhan is that it called them to pray. But the masjid was filled by the sound of the Adhan, people coming to the house of Allah. Today, we have every single type of mode of telling us the time for congregational prayer. Every single type of mode to tell us the time for congregational prayer. Electronic devices, the other not just sounded from what? The top of one's voice from the Muazzin, but from a PA system, a sound system that can travel for miles. And what is the congregational like for Salah? What is the difference then and now? What was the purpose of the Azan? What is the asal and the reason behind the Azan? The Rasul says, calling people to pray. And what are the words of the Azan? Part of the words of the Azan tells us, Hayyala Salah, come to what? Success. Because it says that in prayer there is success. And when the Adhan is sounded, what does it do? Many of the hadith mentions, it chases away the what? The shaitan. The Adhan chases away the shaitan. Because prayer moves out Satan from our life. But what was the fikr and the concern of the Sahabas is very important. That is, that they made effort to get this salah in their life. They made effort to put the azan so that people will become together on the time for congregational prayer. Especially that the brothers would unite and come to the house of Allah for ibadat and worship. Because that is the founding and most important part of the deen. That is why we are existing as Muslims. This is what we try to establish in our community, pray, which is the other part of it. But the Adhan itself connects people to what? 
the masjid. When the adhan is sounded, those people who have iman would understand that this adhan tells you that the house of Allah, the masjid, is waiting for you. The house of Allah is waiting for your ibadat and worship. What excuse do we have? What are the priorities that we would give when the azan is sounded? So the sahabas, anhum, their concern was to announce it so that people would not miss congregational prayer. They will not miss congregational prayer. They had the desire to perform congregational prayer, but to get it in the exact time that everyone will be together, the Adhan was formulated for that. And if we look at that today, in reference to the Adhan being used to bring people together for the connection to the masjid, whilst the Adhan is called today, what we use as excuse? We didn't hear the Adhan, or we don't have a, a phone to give us an alarm, or some reminding thing. We have every possible thing. Every possible thing. And look at the difference. Look at the difference. Five times a day, no matter where we are, we have massages all over this country. All over this country, there are massages. And we may not be committed to all five times salah in the masjid, but as much as we can get in the house of Allah, as much as we can have in the house of Allah, we should do it. We should do it because the azan tells us, connect to the house of Allah. That was the message of the Adhan, that if you want success, come to the house of Allah. Come to the house of Allah. Come for Salah because that is success. That is what they made Shura and Ijma and consultation and agreement upon. That they all came together and agreed that the Azan will be the way to invite people to the house of Allah. They did not use a flag. If they had used a flag, just imagine. What would happen? If they had used bells or some trumpet, what would happen? But the adhan, that sound that comes from this, tells us that this announcement calls us, come to the house of Allah. Come to the house of Allah. It proclaims and glorifies Allah's name and it tells us that the testification that there is only one God. And that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, inspired the companions and in consultation that agreement came and it became the best means until today. There is no sound that is so great as the adhan. There is no benefit, in other words, you know, no, no airline or information that can be given in such a comprehensive way that it tells you about your deen. That a person, if he goes and just conveys the message of the Adhan, conveys the message of what Allah wants for mankind. It is a complete bayan or lecture in every aspect of it. It tells us everything about what this deen is about. The Adhan. It, and no doubt, he may have heard the Adhan in the moon, but you know, the objective here is that what? A bayan. The whole lecture, the whole prospect of deen lies in the Adhan. Because one call tells us what this deen is about. After the establishment of this, the next important aspect is the status of Salah in Islam. Because the call was to come for Salah. On page 470, it tells us, before the advent of Islam, there was no religion in the world which did not test the importance of salah or prayer. However, because different religions were restricted to certain times and confined to certain nations, they slowly lost, they slowly lost the practical importance of salah because people themselves lost the understanding understanding and the purpose behind salah in our present time there is no religion in the pre-islamic pre time whose salah possesses any acknowledgement of devotedness to allah any or any clear definition of his praise and adoration and any emphasis on its performance what is salah in islam 
When the adhan is sounded, it also proclaims Allah's name and his deen. When the salah is done by that individual, what does it do? Every single prostration, every single thing that is recited in salah does what? Only magnifies the name of Allah and sends the root on the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa It tells us that salah teaches us that our life in that prayer, salah, we can make all type of du'as afterwards. Any long du'a for whatever you want and whatever tawbah you want. But when you are in salah, what the only thing that we do is praise Allah. Worship Allah alone. Identify Allah as the sole being that is the creator that deserves worship and prostration. Nothing else. That is what salah tells us. It teaches us that it should remove from our hearts any sort of inclination and attachment to the world. If a person develops the love for salah, he detaches himself from the world. In other words, the world does not attack his heart. The affairs of this world does not take control of his mind. The affairs of anything cannot be what? Taken control over him. If he really makes salah the important part of his life. But we have seen nations come and go on, and their ibadat has changed. Their system and worship from salah has gone. They have left out the rukuns and the importance of ibadat. They have left out even some of them kneeling and praying. Some of them what made ablution to pray. They don't even what have ablution. They do not even make themselves pure by istinja and pure purification of their body, their clothes, the way they dress. Every aspect of it they have been forgotten. In this deen of Islam, if we want to maintain the importance of ibadat, salah, then all these things that are mentioned as the parts of the rituals of ibadat from wudu, from istinja, the way we clean our body, the way we dress, the way we should attend to the salah, the way we do siwak, brushing our teeth, making sure that every aspect of that salah is preparation for it is done properly. And then we stand for salah, we do it with such khushu, such devotion, that we think that this salah is only for Allah, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not what, you know, accept it from us, but accept our ibadat. This is what we are doing it for. Least it becomes such a thing, that we only do it because of a custom. Because of a custom. So the true form of salah is neither evident from the actions of their followers nor from their leaders. Not a prophet came except that their prophet was commanded by Allah to perform salah and who did not urge his followers for salah. And this is very important. Every ambiya that Allah sent on this world for it was the purpose of ibadat and worship. They came not just to rectify the lives of people from the dunya or to rectify a situation or a condition of their immorality, but more so to teach them to worship Allah. Because in worship to Allah, it removes and eradicates immorality. It eradicates from us those things that the world attachment comes to. This is what is important about salah. So every prophet came with this mission that if a person establish ibadat and salah in their life, it will change. Clearly defined and exhortive way as in Islam, salah is an obligatory duty to, on every Muslim. It has been given an extremely organized, well-defined, prominent and exhortative form so that it remains as well established a pillar or foundation of Islam. It remains that foundation and pillar. Because if someone look, if he wants to understand, to have that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he has to become a person who is connected to Allah by salah. If he wants to break that, that connection, he wants to be disconnected from Allah, then he leaves all salah. If a person wants Allah in his life, then he connects through salah. But if he doesn't want that, then he does not want salah in his life. If we want Allah in our life, if we want our lives to change, then we want to have salah in our life. And that comes from the adhan and the salah. This is what this deen was established upon. Rasulullah, wherever he went, he put the masjid in place. Then he put now what? Adhan in place. Then he put what? Salah in place. Because this is what the ummah strives upon, upon everything else that goes on outside of salah. The daily activities, more than that, he did not seek to set up his personal life. He set up for us and shown to us in the very inception 
that the house of Allah, ibadat is worship, is important. And next to it, the place, the platform, the school, the madrasa, ashabu sufa, the madrasa for learning. Salah and ilm, knowledge and salah goes hand in hand. These are the things that the Rasulullah set up to show us that the propagation of deen and the establishment of worship, which is most important for the success of our lives in this world. If it's nothing more important to us, we should recognize is our ibarat. This is what was shown to us in the very beginning here from this migration of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam coming to Medina, coming to Medina, set up in Cuba, set up in Medina, even around the Kaaba, the house of Allah. The main objective was Salah, worship. If a person studies the life of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and never studies the importance of Salah as the most important thing as he has shown us every other thing else, but he emphasized upon his companions, ibarat and worship, salah, as being the priority, as being the priority. And that's why we are told that we should also establish it amongst our family. This is important. Many a times we put aside this importance of adhan and salah from our family. We don't understand that this deen and the purpose of our family and the purpose of the masjid and the purpose of everything that we do in Islam as a Muslim starts with prayer, salah. And that comes first. That comes first. If we have to teach our children everything else, the first of the things that you teach them when they come in that state of understanding is pray, worship. Ibarat to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if we don't teach them salah, then we are reneging against what we have made an appointment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of iman and what our purpose as Muslims are, as parents are towards our children. If we do not teach them how to perform salah, if we don't put them in the environment of deen, who are going to do it? This is what the Sahabah uh, did. And we'll come to that point, Lord. Mentions here again, page 442, after mentioning about Salah and the establishment of this, then the Rasulullah went to one further stage. The joining of the Muhajir, the migrants, and the Ansar, the helpers. So after establishing the house of Allah, then he goes now to unite the people together. The migrants or the muhajirs had come from Mecca without anything of their own. Some of them had been quite rich and well-to-do, but they had left their homes in, in secret in fear of greater persecution or even death at the hands of the Quraysh and had not been able to take their belongings to Medina. They couldn't take it and they didn't want to what? Run away by chance because of the continuous persecution. They left all these things in Mecca and went to Medina for their deen, their Islam. The Ansar had opened up their homes for the Muhajirs, but the permanent arrangement was necessary for they did not like to subsist on charity. In other words, they, they were staying there in Medina. They were being helped. But they need to set up an economic system that the Ansars and the Muhajirs, the migrants and the helpers, in other words, the people who came to Medina and meet these people in Medina, they will be able to help them and make them establish themselves. They were used to working hard for their living. However, at the mo that moment, they were penniless and had nothing whatsoever to begin with. So the Prophet Sallallahu taught it best that Fraternal ties should be established between them and the Ansars. Fraternal ties. That this is ties without blood relationship. These are ties that the Rasul says, I am making you him your brother. He's not your blood brother, but I'm making him your brother. He is no part of your family. He takes a migrant, a muhajir, and joins him with an Ansar and says, he is your brother. When the mosque was almost completed, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam invited the Ansars and they assembled at the home of Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was just at that time 10 years old or a 10 year old boy. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then addressed the Ansars. Anas was only what? 10 years old. Think about a 10 year old who is so serious about Deen today that will make such effort on Deen. 
and he assembles at the home of Anas at the age of 10. That young boy. He says, the Prophet then addressed the Ansars and said to them, they are your brothers. Whom? The Muhajirs. Then he sallallahu alayhi wa said and called people to him in twos, one from the Muhajir and one from the Ansars and told them that they were brothers. Thereafter, they really lived like brothers. They really lived like brothers after that. Once they were joined by the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they lived like brothers. The Ansar brother took his Muhajir brother to his house and showed him everything he had at his home and told him that half of it belongs to him. Half of it belongs to him. The main wealth of the Ansar consisted of oasis, date palm plantations, and not a type of cash as we know today. The request, they requested the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to divide their groves equally between them and their brother Muhajirs. So they tell the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you take our land, take whatever we have and share it in half. Give them half. This is what the Ansars, their own brother and Dean, are prepared to do for them. The Muhajirs were traders. The migrants of Makkah, they were big businessmen, traders. That's what they are accustomed to doing. And knew nothing of cultivation. It's like town meeting what? Countryside. So they did not what? Have the understanding of what agriculture, how to develop land and to produce goods and those type of things. But they were business people. They knew how to spend wealth, buy, purchase, trade, do all these type of transactions. This is what they were accustomed to. Hence the Prophet Sallallahu you know, the Muhajirs were traders and knew nothing of cultivation. And hence the Prophet ﷺ refused it on behalf of the Muhajirs. Because he says, look, you give them land, they, they don't know what to do with it. You give them land, they don't know what to do with it. In other words, you give them it, they can't use it effectively. So he continues and says that... It's a, Muhajirs, you know, he mentioned about, you know, she refused it on behalf of the Muhajirs. The Ansar said they would manage the whole business and give half of the produce to their brothers. What's the difference now? One was take half the land and work it yourself. The Prophet said, no, these people can't work land. They can't do anything. So the Ansar says, no, we will take the land, the same land that you're offering, we'll utilize it produce it and give them half the produce. Not that they will not work, the Muhajirs will work alongside the Ansars, but says if they can do it, we'll manage it for them, and after managing it for them, still give them half. This, what they were prepared to do, in no way and in no time ever to come again, will there be such people who would exist with such hearts. There's no one to compare with them from then to now that will ever make such things for their brothers. Never. They will always want the best for themselves. But these people, the Ansars, were not like that. They said they will even go so far to give them half from when they work the lands. Because this is what they came for deen with. This is what Islam came to them with. In other words, they came and accepted this religion and understand that this Islam needs sacrifice. It needs effort for it to continue. And so, you know, when we look at it, these people who came into this deen, especially for amongst the young people, and as this 10 years old, in his house such a discussion is taking place. And amongst the consultations, amongst the answers that they would give, they will be prepared to what? Labor the lands and give half of it. The youths of today, where are they? Where are the youths from our own communities? How many of them are active in the house of Allah? Active in the deen? Active in consciously understanding the purpose of existing in Islam and the purpose of what? Fulfilling some of the demands that Islam requires from them. Where are they? Many are massages you will go into and you will not see the youths. 
You will not see the youths because they are not consciously and seriously concerned about Islam. Why? It's a very simple and easy answer. Because their family, their home, their fathers, their mothers, their community never show them how important this deen is to them that they can make serious decisions in the importance of this deen. How to live this deen, how to contribute to this deen, what they should do with this deen, this Islam. But at the time of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa those youths, they were part and parcel of the deen. Their lives were connected to this Islam 100%. They from youth, they wanted to live their life and do anything for this deen, to propagate a deen in whatever form it can. But today we teach our children the importance of everything else, but to teach them the importance of propagating this deen. And the importance to hold on to this deen. Just think about it. Why they are not here is because we do not teach them how important it is to be here. Not just to my class, but just to be functioning in the house of Allah. To be part and parcel of functioning in the house of Allah, where are they? We always shun them, push them aside. We always try to keep our role, our responsibility that we alone, you know, we alone here. But if we side by side, together, work hand in hand with our youths, as we ought to in deen, because this is what Islam did with his youths. He made them and put them and showed them that this deen of Islam is theirs. It is not something that they should just take lightly as a part of their life, but it's their whole life. It is an entirety of their life. As a Muslim, it is the entirety of their life. That whatever they do in their life, it is Islam. It is Islam. And let's imagine if we as parents, as adults, as uncles, as aunts, cannot teach our children this. Show them that this Islam is their way of life and their only way of life and show them the importance of it. Then what, do we, what are we going to get in the future? We are going to end up with the same type of system that they only look at this place as a customary kind of thing. The things are already in place. But we must never be naive into thinking this way. Never be naive into thinking that everything is well and good and deen. That Islam is going ahead and we are not planning ahead. That we are not making effort for deen to go forward. But we expect this Islam to go forward. Once the day pass, or the week pass, or the Friday pass, or the Eid pass, or the Ramadan pass, or the Salah time pass, that's all we are waiting on. We are not planning ahead for what this deen requires from us. What Allah demands from us as we live life and confront every situation that comes from us every day. We might be able to survive this deen, but what about our children when they are faced with further fitna and corruption? What about the, the hardships they are going to face? It is not easy. The things and the, the morality and the difficulties that they are going to face and the challenges they are going to face will never be anything close to what we are facing. And if we do not educate them and bring them up in deen, what is going to be their condition? What is going to be their condition? Sahabas, the Rasul kept his youth in his congregation, kept his young followers with him in his community, within himself, keeping them there so that they would understand that this Islam is theirs, that they have to take it and carry it forward. That they have to carry it forward. Because we are not here forever. And we cannot protect anyone. And we cannot protect this deen. Allah protect this deen, but Allah can use us and use our children to protect this deen. This is what is founded and thought out clearly from what we have read here. That despite their coming to the house, and bringing them together, the Muhajir and the Ansar, putting them together was for the establishment and showing them, showing to these youths that you could be from which part of the world. You are a Muslim. You travel from Mecca to Medina. And Rasulullah says, you are bonded in fraternity. You are brothers. That you have to work together. You have to work together. If we look sometime today at our society, our own Muslims, our own Muslims, we fight and destroy each other. We're not working together. If you see somebody struggling and trying to do effort and work for Dean, and he's not in your organization, you finish him. However, you can get him to finish, you finish him. As though 
two of us on some different path. As though when we go on the day of judgment, Allah will ask you from this organization, or from that organization, or whether he is a Sunni, from this Sunni tribe, or whether he is a Shafi or a Hanbali or a Maliki, or these questions. You know, which school of law you come from? If you are Muqallid, Gai Muqallid, what are the questions you're going to be asked about? You know, these are the things we think about. We always fight within ourselves. When the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bring the Muhajirs and the Ansar, he didn't tell them who was what? Foreigner and who was helper? Who was migrant and who was there established? He didn't talk about that. He said, you are now brothers in deen. Your brothers in deen. This is your purpose to live Islam together. Share your wealth. Share your time. Share this deen together. Live it together. Worship together. Establish the house of Allah together. This is what they came together for. But when we see the sad situation of the Muslims today, we don't even leave room for anyone to hate us. We hate ourselves. We don't leave room for anybody else. And that is not something that is far-fetched. It is the reality today. People will stand up and bad talk one another. When they were their people, and talk about different monarchic and hypocrites to do it, you know. Forget the hypocrites. Talk about Muslims who in their own groups will bad talk our next group. This is what they do. You would hear it, you would see it. You feel it, and you would know it. It exists. And we're talking about a small little country like this. Far less for other places. And we're calling ourselves Muslims. And we're living for the sake of Allah. And we're doing ibadat, and we're doing deen. We have to be really, really sick in our minds to think like that. When we look at what has been taught to us, what has been taught to us here by the Rasul teaching us what is migration and immigrants coming to meet in our brotherhood for the deen. They are meeting for the purpose of establishing this deen in the lives of people, protecting themselves, elevating themselves in iman. This is what we are here together for. If we cannot unite together for this purpose of iman and deen, then what are we existing for? What is the purpose of being together? Why are we here, my brothers? You know, this is this purpose. In our own communities, amongst our own selves, we are fighting. We are destroying each other. We have things to say about each other. Things that even though it has no connection to deen, maybe some family problem, maybe some other issue, some land dispute or some other things, but that destroys the deen. That we use those things to destroy the work of deen. We use petty issues to create confusion amongst ourselves. When the masjid, Rasulullah is telling us that when we are in a brotherhood, is that it's not about issues like those that should divide us. Those are not issues. Those are not things that the Sahabas, the companions, what the Ansars are showing us here, that they did not fight for property. They did not fight for any position. They did not fight to become the better upper hand person. They were prepared to share because the Rasulullah said, you must share. You must live as brothers, not for the condition otherwise. This is what has been told to us clearly here. But yet, but yet it can never come true to our hearts why we are here. Why we establish ourselves in a community for unity. What we see here in history is not just history, but it is what Islam was founded upon. It is what the Rasulullah used to bring people together to show us Muslims who are here today from all the years coming by that if we cannot do this then what do we leave for deen? What do we leave in this Islam? What do we leave and what do we understand this Islam to be? If we want people to come into this deen we have to get our act together. We have to get our condition straightened out to understand what the Rasul has been telling us here. It goes so far that he knows I mentioned it says that The Muhajirs, it mentions that the Ansar said they would manage the whole business and give half of the produce to their, to their brothers. This the Muhajir accepted. Not just accepted, in other words, they didn't want to take anything on their own because they said no, they're going to waste anything. If they cannot do it, they'll work side by side with you, you manage it, and if you want to give us whatever, we'll accept it. They were prepared to give half. The new brotherhood was treated as real kinship to such an extent that whenever an Ansari died, his property was inherited by his Muhajir brother and not by his own kinsmen. SubhanAllah. 
Look at the extent that this relationship went to. None could ever surpass them. That even, not even in brotherhood, they were not like blood relations, but yet when they died, they transferred their property to whom? Their brother in that level. And he continues and mentions that this was the obedience to the divine order contained in the Holy Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, he says, Surely those who believe and immigrated and struggled hard in the way of Allah with their riches and their lives, and those who give shelter to the immigrants and help them, they are indeed the friends of one another. Surah Anfal, Surah number 8, verse number 72, tells us clearly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors them. Allah honors them. Allah raised their status because what was in their hearts was never a, a dot or an iota of hypocrisy to each other. They never had hatred to each other. They never had jealousy. They never had greed towards each other. That is how they lived. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed it in a way that we could see it. That Allah sees in their heart what they were about. Allah shows us what their hearts contain and magnify them and show that why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah anhum, but Allah pleased with them. Allah became pleased with them because they were such people. They were such people. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to mention them in the Quran for us to understand what type of lives we ought to live. After the battle of Badr, the muhajirs were no more in need of support. So this verse was revealed. But those who are related by blood are nearer one to another in the matters of inheritance. Surah Anfal and the verse mentioned in Surah number 8, verse number 75. So Allah SWT says, I know what is in your heart, but you still have an obligation to your blood relationship. You still have an obligation to your blood relationship. They were so much strong on this relationship with their fraternity, with their brothers from Makkah, that they were prepared to do this. And Allah says, no, you still have an obligation towards your blood brothers. Subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the order. Allah changed the order that your brotherhood that you have established is so strong that even this you would do. And Allah is saying, I am telling you, Allah, Rabbalizah, Allah is saying, you give to your blood relationship too. You give your wealth when you die in inheritance to your blood relationship too. So inshallah, we'll stop there today. You know, it's a very, very lovely, important part of our, our, our discussion, discuss here, inshallah. And um, we'll continue, inshallah, on that page 473, inshallah, next class. Uh, let us do a couple minutes, inshallah, in our tafsir. Surah Muhammad. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Surah Muhammad, Surah number 47 of the Holy Quran, and we are on verse number 24. I think it should be 24. And prior to this, in this surah, we are talking about from last class, verse number 20 to 23, which talks about the verses in reference to Qital and those people who, when the verse was revealed concerning fighting and going out in the battlefields, Allah mentions the word Qital, that the hypocrites, when this verse was revealed, their faces changed as though they were going to faint. As though when they hear this, they get weak. Their knees started to shake. They don't want to ever go out in the battlefields. Allah SWT revealed about that and mentions in the verse 20 to 23 concerning that. And he continues and tells us here now in verse 24, he says about those people, you know, they were in the line of nifaq and hypocrisy. He says, Afalayta dabbarun al-Qur'ana? Afalayta dabbarun al-Qur'ana? Am ala kulubihim akfalahum? Is it that these people, do they ever ponder and think about this Quran? Do they ever really ponder and think about the words of Allah? We're talking about the time when the Prophet ﷺ was in Medina now and the battles came up before them. And the people of the Munafik, the hypocrites, they were around them. They are around the companions, the true believers. Just like us. They will be just looking like every other Muslim, dressed everything perfectly just like them. But what was their condition? Allah says, Do they not ponder and think? Or is it that their hearts, ala kulubihim akfalahum, that is their heart, is they are locking their heart? 
Is it that their hearts are locked? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about it. So we would understand clearly a very important underlying statement here. A person who has a lock on a door, what do you think they put a lock for? To prevent anything or anyone from what? Entering into it. So they safeguard it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, is it that they have time to ponder and think about the Quran? Or is it that their hearts have a lock on it? That they would hear. But they seal their hearts that they will never even ponder to hear anything. They don't even ponder on what they hear. In other words, they, they hear it, but out of that hearing is only rebuts. What to see, what to do, what to say, what to do. But it never goes in their heart to even ponder and think what they're really hearing. Allah says, Akfalahum, it bounces back. It's as though it goes in there and it can't make entry. It, is it their hearts have a lock on it? Allah Taala mentions this ayat that you know that they would not even ponder upon it. They will not ponder upon the ayats of Allah Taala. But what if, what if they only ponder over the words of Allah Taala? He mentions in the next verse, he says, Inna al-ladhin artaddu. And what if they were really, really and truly pondering over the words of Allah? What if they were doing that? Then what will happen to their hearts? It will change. It will change. But they don't want to do that. Furthermore, he says, And those people who are murtad, who turn away from the deen of Islam after Iman is before them. After Allah says, Tabayyana lahum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies for them Iman. Allah makes and shows to them Iman and they understand this deen. And then uh, what happens to them? They murtad. They turn away from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He mentions, Inna alladhina artadda ala adbarihim min ba'di ma bayyana lahum al huda. Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them Iman. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown them what is Iman, they now turn away from it. Why? Allah SWT explains why. He said, why people would leave this deen? And the difference, he says, there's no difference between a monafic and a murtad. Because they're on the same line. Because what happens, he says, a shaitanu sawwala lahum wa amla lahum. That shaitan, he himself, makes in their life. Sawwala lahum. He decorates for them their fancies, their goals, their objective. What they want in life and what they feel is good, he grants them that. He makes them feel that this is the best thing. And he makes them live in their dreams. He makes them live in their dreams. And he makes them feel that life is long. Life is long. You have long to live. Don't worry. You can continue like this. You'll never get caught up in anything, man. You'll never get sick. Nothing will ever happen to you. You are going on the right path. You're enjoying life. Everything will be good. Don't worry. Allah SWT says, Shaitanu sawwalahum. Allah SWT tells us that this is what happens to these people. That they turn away from this deen because of this. Because of this. Some people, you know that you are bashing people, but what you should look at is understand what is from turning away from deen. A person wants to get married to someone and he gets objections from his family. Can't marry. He says, all right, well, you want to be a Muslim no more? What becomes the, the, the turning point for him? Sawwalahum, shaitan decorates for him that this individual that you want to get married to, he is telling you the correct thing. He will begin to grant you a good worldly life, but nobody can see this. He is giving me all the comforts. No, not, not, not my parents on birthday, they never give me this comfort. They grow me up, but they didn't understand that this person I'm going to get married to is going to be the person for the rest of my life. What a deception. What a deception that you fall in love with such person that is going to take you to the fire of hell. But shaitan is telling you that not even your parents, their words are good today. Not even the advice of the imam or the alim, nobody can give you advice because their advice is no good. What a deception. It is not that people cannot come into the deen of Islam and get married. Nothing is wrong with that. Nothing is wrong with that. But a person gives up his deen because of that. 
Allah decorates for them. Rasul, shaitan decorates for them. Sorry. What they see as being wrong to be what? Right. Even in business, even in business it happens. In business, people say to themselves, they get so preoccupied in business that they look at this life and the business and say, why do all these things? I'm comfortable now. I don't see any of these things. They fall prey like Karun and the rest of them. Fall straight down to what? Deception. Shaitan makes them feel that they are so good. Everything gone. Even the alim, the scholars themselves also, some of them what? Become murtad. Turn away from the deen. Shaitan. Turn away from the deen. Who made prostration all over Jannah? Satan. He what? Became arrogant himself and now wants to make us become arrogant. By what? Thinking that we are too good to prostrate to Allah. So what happens? We give it up. We give it up. Why do that for? That is so much a difficulty. Hardship, praying five times a day. Why make wuzu? Why do this? Get up in the morning early to pray. Why fast in the month of Ramadan? Why do all these things? So hard, so hard. Everything becomes hard. But otherwise, you can sit down and watch 10 hours of TV. That's not hard. Not hard at all. You can lime and talk for hours by the bridge. That's not hard at all. You could do everything else. That's not hard at all. But to do ibarat, five minutes, is the most difficult thing. It becomes the most difficult thing. Because shaitan, sawalahum. He decorates their heart in such a way, makes them feel that this is the condition. Such a hope. But on that day, he says, I fear Allah, and I turn on heel and he gone. Leaves us in that state. Allah, may Allah Allah save us from such things. May he save us from the trick of shaitan. Because it's one of the most dangerous things that can ever come our path. So, it mentions you know, that they apostate the religion in this condition. They become munafik and hypocrites on this condition. That they think to themselves that these people are up to nothing. In time of Rasulullah the munafiks that they used to do, come there and watch them and say, watch them. Yes, a bunch of people doing nothing, just talking. Doing anything but nothing but talking. And at the end of it, Allah SWT says that that which Allah SWT attracted into their hearts is the attachment to this world and they forget all about Allah. So shaitan makes them love this world and forget all about Allah. It is just like sometimes that we see our children today. Once they get attachment to these little games, press buttons, and little toys, you can get them to do anything. Once they get that, they forget you. They forget you. You exist in right. Are you talking to them? They can't hear you. That's how we live in the big world today, in the bigger game. At least our children have a little game in the hand and you can see them how they're distracted. We in the bigger game and we are so caught up that we're not even taking time to recognize that this is the place where the real business is. The real business and ibarat is. But we are distracted. So he tells us in the last verse, it mentions, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا لِلَّذِينَ كَرِحُوا مَا نَزَّلَ اللَّهُ سَنُطِيعُكُ Kum fi ba'dil amri wallahu ya'lamu israrahum. And Allah says that these are the people, the reason why they are like this, He says, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ لَهُمْ Because they say to those people, كَرِحُوا مَا نَزَلَ اللَّهُ Who say to those people who dislike what Allah has revealed, yani the, the, amongst them in Medina, there were the people called the Jews, who are existing, which we'll talk about when we're doing the seerah. A little lower on the next topic, right? We'll talk about them as well. It mentions that karihu, that they dislike the Muslims coming to Medina. They dislike the Rasulullah coming to Medina. But before the Rasulullah come to Medina, who knew about him? The Jews were foretold in their books and the past scriptures tell of the coming of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they even mentioned the people of the coming of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Salman Farsi, the story mentioned before, talks about him. But when he came, they ought to hear nothing about him. And Allah SWT says that those people who had nifaq and hypocrisy sided with those Jews at that point in time. He says, Ya yuhal bidhalika bi annahum qalu lilladhina karihu ma nazal Allahu. That those people who dislike 
from the people of Medina. He says, Sanu'ti ma'akum that we will follow you fi ba'dil amr in whatever you tell us to do. So they now instigated these people to create in fighting and distortion and, dis and disunity amongst the people. This is what the effort and the work of the munafik and hypocrite at the time. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu ya'lamu israrahum. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows their secret. And why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayats? So that we will become aware of their secrets. And the Rasul sallallahu and his companions will become aware of their secrets. And we'll continue in the next class, inshallah. That at this point in time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after a time came, that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam expelled all of them from Medina. Which will do part of the seerah as well. Okay, so we stop with this verse, verse number 26, inshallah, and continue at our next class. Jazakallah khair. You